Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise once again. It is good to be in your presence with your family. And we do pray that today that you would speak to us, Lord. Through your word, show us the glory of your Son. Give us power to grasp the depth of your love for us in him. Lord, speak. And by your Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear. And open our hearts to receive your word this day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking today at uh, continuing in John chapter 6 on page 1135 in your pew Bibles. Our focus will be on verses 35 to 40 today. And the sermon notes are in your bulletin uh, if you wish to follow along there as well. Again, I can't encourage you enough to... um, Use those connection cards and, or just through the website or through uh, email to let us know how we can be praying for you. We all go through some great troubles. And as you know, we send out, those who are on the email list know that we send out requests of what people need help with. And these last couple of weeks, we've had some really painful requests, several of them, of just heartache and loss and, and pain. And we, we know that we all must go through them. We all must endure pain and heartbreak in this life. But uh, we don't have to go through them alone. But we all suffer. But we can suffer together for one thing. And that's why it's so important for us to be praying for each other during these times. And I thank you for your prayers and encouragement. I know it's meant a lot to those who have been struggling uh, greatly these last few weeks. But, you know, in these struggles, especially when we deal with this kind of heartache and loss, the the questions come up, and the first question is always the same. It's, why? Why is this happening? Why does God ordain such things? For what purpose does he break our hearts? What is he doing? It's an important question to ask, and I would say this, it's important to ask it sincerely. Not as a simple complaint, voicing frustration, and to walk away not waiting for any kind of answer. There is answers to these questions, and it's an important one of why. What is God's purpose in all these things? And then secondly, what what does he want from us now? What should we be doing? What now? Where do we go with this? In other words, I would ask the question this way. What is the will and the work of God in this troubled and evil world? And then, what does he want from us? What is to be the will and work of his people in this troubled and evil world? And that's what we're going to look at today, and I think our passage today is, I found to be particularly helpful in John 6, 35 to 40. Again, if you turn there with me on page 1135, after Christ feeds the 5,000, the beginning of the chapter, those who came to him, does an absolute miracle, feeding them all, fully satisfying them. And then when they want to make him king, if you remember, he withdraws from them. The disciples cross the lake, and he meets them. He walks on water, meeting them on the lake, and then he brings them safely to the other side. And then the people seek him now. They're trying to find Christ. And he tells them, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill, and you want more to eat. And he doesn't feed them again, but he has a discourse with them that doesn't seem to go particularly well seems to unravel as with every interaction as they ask a question he responds it just gets worse and worse until uh, spoiler alert they all leave him at the end but in this passage here john 6 35 to 40 he he gives his first of seven what are called the i am sayings of christ in the gospel of john where he says i am something i am the bread of life here He'll later on say things like, I am the resurrection, the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the vine. This is the first of the seven. And every time he says one of these I am sayings, he is saying to us, I am. He is the Lord. He is revealing God to us. Pay attention to these. John 
wants us to pay deep attention to these sayings here. Because every time he speaks this way, he's revealing something about the Lord, about God himself, and about not just about God himself and who he is, but his plan and how he does things. And you need to know these things. Otherwise, we will be frustrated and embittered in this miserable life. And here, pay attention to what he says now in verse 35 to 40, because he speaks specifically several times of the will of God. Why he does what he does. So let's read this one more time. This is on page 1135, chapter 6 of John, 35 to 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks in the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. He speaks here of the will of the Father. So we want to focus, try to get wrap our minds around what is the will of and the work of God in this world. What is he doing? What is his purposes? And he tells us very clearly, this is the will of my Father. I want to stress this first. You will never know or understand anything about God until you know him as Father. He says, this is the will of my Father. Jesus teaches us when you pray, you pray our Father. When you get baptized, You get baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You must know God as Father. God presents that, so Jesus presents himself to us. He doesn't say, this is the will of the Creator, because God wasn't always the Creator. There was a time when God had not created anything yet. He doesn't say, this is the will of the Judge or even the Savior, Because there was a time when God had not yet judged and not yet saved anyone. But there was never a time when God was not Father. He is eternally Father. That's who He is. That's the deepest part of His nature. He is forever Father. And to understand the will of God, you must understand the will of the Father. And the Father's will, you may know, is all about family, isn't it? Everything a father does, if he's a true father, is for the family. And remember the first truth that we learn about God is that the father loves the son. Everything is driven by that love. And so this passage here, I've I've connected it to Paul's letter to the Ephesians because in Ephesians chapter 1, he speaks about God's will there and he uses different terms. He's saying the same basic thing that Jesus is saying here, but he says it in a way that adds a little more clarity to it. So I'm going to ask you to do this. If you hold your spot, maybe put a little bookmark in John 6, because we're going to come back to it. And turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 on page 1241. Page 1241, Ephesians chapter 1. And he says this in verse 3. He begins his letter this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. This is his will. What is the will of the Father? What is he doing? What is, what is his purpose in all things? Well, we see here in Ephesians 1, 
His purpose is this, to choose people like us from all nations for adoption. Did you catch that? He didn't just choose us and predestined us so that we could live forever in heaven. He chose us, he predestined us for adoption as sons. That's the eternal plan. You'll notice that plan was enacted before the foundation of the world. That's when he determined to do this. It's an eternal plan of God to choose people for adoption. So God the Father sees this sea of humanity, billions of people, all of every last one of them made in his image and after his likeness. And every last one of them gone astray, rebelling against him under his wrath and judgment. Every last one of them damned because of our wickedness. And out of this mess of humanity, of all these sinners, he chooses a family for himself. He determines to adopt people into his own eternal family who will experience He predestined us for adoption. That was his will. You want to know why God does things? This is why he does things. He's a father and he chooses people for adoption. And what does he want to do with these sons? Well, that's when we connect it now back to John 6. So Jesus says it this way. All that the father, verse 37 of John 6, all that the father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Because the Father loves the Son, he gives all things to the Son. And out of love for his Son, he adopts us in order to give us his, to his son as an eternal family. This is what Jesus means when he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. He's not talking about things here. He's talking about people, the family that God the Father will give to the Son. So we can put it this way, the will and work of God, the will of God the Father is this, to choose people for adoption and then to give this family to his Son. That's his will. That's what he's doing. This is the mystery of love. The joy of love is this. The wonder of love is this. Is that when there are more people added into this family, the love is not diluted. It's magnified. It's intensified. As any family knows this. Moms always, I hear this from moms a lot. It's like you... you you give birth to this child. You can't imagine yourself loving anything more than that, possibly. And then when you bring another child into the home, you, you're fearful that you don't have enough love to go around. No, your heart gets bigger with this, doesn't it? It encompasses all of them even more. And so, and we are frail, pathetic human beings. How much more the love of the Father and the Son is magnified, intensified with every new family member that is added in. And so out of a gift of love to the son, the father determines he will not be an only child. He will have a family and he will have millions, maybe billions from all nations adopted to be his family. That's what God is doing. That's his will. And Jesus says, I did not come to do my will. I came to do the will of him who sent me. Now we want to take a look at what God is doing, how God accomplishes this will. The Father declared his will, but this will is accomplished not by the Father, but by the Son. It's the Son who will accomplish the will of the Father. That's what he says. The Father makes the declaration. The Son will make it happen. And so Jesus says, come back with me to John 6 again, page 1135. Hold your spot in Ephesians. Don't lose that. John 6. 
Jesus says this. Now he says, look, I came down not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And he says it this way. Verse 37, again. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The first work of the Son is to receive this family from the Father. All that the Father has given me, every last one of those whom God has given to me, who come to me, I will receive every last one of them. I will never cast them out. The Son receives with joy every gift from the Father who loves him. He doesn't throw away anything the Father gives him. And he treasures this gift of this eternal family. And he will not reject even one of his brothers. Jesus loves us, we're told, right? Jesus loves us. The Bible tells us so. Why does Jesus love us so much? Because we are a gift from the Father to him. And he loves his Father. And he cherishes every gift of the Father. And so his first work is to receive this family from the Father. That's why Paul in Ephesians 2 talks about how God made us alive in Christ and he seated us with Christ and he raised us with Christ. Everything is with Christ. He receives us. He's not ashamed to call us his brothers and he is pleased to take us as his own. And having received us, Ephesians 1, 7 said, in him, in Christ, we have redemption by his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. So when he receives us as his family, he doesn't just take us as we are and just put us on the shelf and keep us that way. He takes us and he redeems us. He cleanses us. He redeems them by his blood on the cross. He takes their sin as we sang that beautiful hymn, there's a fountain filled with blood, right? And we're plunged within that flood and we lose all our guilty stains and forgiveness. And even though we're as vile as the thief on the cross, we lose our guilty stains and we are cleansed and fit for heaven. That's what he does. Every last one of who come to him, he takes their sins. He bears the wrath of God for them forgives them, sanctifies them, fits them for God's eternal home. Again, the, the adoption analogy is really helpful because you can, you can see it. Here is a loving family whose love abounds and can't, it needs to go further. It needs to go to those who have never experienced love. And so they go to the streets, to the orphans there. And they see these filthy, neglected, unloved, unloving children. Just vile, disgusting. But no matter, there is love here. And there's grace and mercy for these little ones. And so they take the child home with them. They choose him. They take him home for adoption. But before they bring him in the house... They just don't bring him in like that. Because, because imagine, imagine bringing in a filthy child into your home and he's just filthy and disgusting. Not only does it ruin the home, but imagine the shame of this child in this place. You know, out on the streets, he fits in with everybody else. But here, now he feels his shame. It's not right. No. You first, you have to give him a bath and give him proper clothes and Make him fit for this place. That's exactly what Christ does for us. If he were to just take us as we are and bring us into God's home, it would be miserable for everybody. We would make it miserable, and we would be miserable because we know we don't belong here. We are filthy and vile, but Christ cleanses us by his death on the cross, takes our sins away, gives us his clothes of righteousness, and now heaven really is our home. We really do belong here. We really do belong. And so that's what Christ does. His great work, that's why he came to do. To, to, to receive all that the Father is giving to him and to cleanse them and redeem them by his blood on the cross. And then he says, oh, there's one more thing. He says this. 
Verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And if you want to know what that means, I'll tell you what that means. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks in the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. All that he has received, he will redeem, and all that he has redeemed, he promises to raise them to eternal life on the last day. That's the hope of our salvation. This is referred to in Ephesians as our inheritance, what we're waiting for. We've not experienced the full salvation of God. We've experienced the taste of it. We've experienced the forgiveness of our sins, but we haven't seen it. That's why it's faith. Our hope is coming when Christ returns and he raises us from our graves. Or if we're alive, changes us and gives us new bodies fit for everlasting life where we will reign with him forever and ever all suffering and pain and sorrow gone forgotten forever and ever that's our hope and so the father in adopting us giving us to the son who cleanses us and fits us treats us exactly as he does his own son because you know if, if anyone here has ever adopted a child i am told there is no distinction you don't introduce them this is my biological son this is my adopted son they're your sons and they each share in the inheritance and he loves us and treats us exactly as he does his own son which is why he says and again in ephesians we are raised with Christ and we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And all that the Son receives, we receive because we're united to him. We're his brothers now. And that's the eternal hope that we have. It's incredible, the gift that he's given to us. Jesus gives us a great analogy in this. Again, John 6, 35 to 40, he begins this whole discussion by telling them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. He describes himself as the bread of life, the bread from heaven, as he, he is like the manna in the wilderness. It's really helpful to understand the work of Christ as compared to the bread that God gave the people of Israel in the wilderness. So I hope you remember this. Exodus 16 has the story. I encourage you to read it. But if you read the story, you'll notice a couple things about the bread of life, the bread from heaven. First, it's bread that came down, down from heaven. It was not made from human hands. It's from heaven come down. Second, the bread that came down from heaven, the manna, was described this way. It was fine, a fine flake-like thing, like frost. So it wasn't like German bread, thick and heavy and dense, you know. It was very weak and fine, like frost that could melt away. Very frail and weak. So it's from heaven, yet it's very frail and weak. And the rule was that they had to consume that, all of it, that day. Nothing could be saved for the next day. It had to be completely consumed. And it was that bread that would satisfy them for their time in the wilderness, and that bread would bring them, enable them to come into the promised land. So with Christ. He is the bread of life. He is the one who came down from heaven. But when he came down from heaven, he did not come in strength. He came in absolute weakness. And when he came, he came to be consumed completely at the cross, bearing the full wrath of God for us. And he came so that we might be sustained in this miserable life, in this wilderness that we go through, through every heartache and pain and loss. And that it, he might bring us in to our eternal home and raise us up at the last day. So this is the will and the work of God in mind here. Now, what, how do we respond to this? Why is God doing things? Why does he do the things that he does? He does it to choose for himself a family. That's his intent here. And to bring them and to give this family to his son who will receive this family, cleanse them, and raise them up on the last day. 
So we have to ask this question now, the question that the crowds asked Jesus in verse 28 of chapter 6. They said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? What do you want from us? How do we live now? What now for us? And Jesus says to them very plainly, he now speaks to the will and to the work of the Christian. Verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. I mean, I said, well, what does that mean to believe in Christ here? And he will expound upon that. In our passage today, 35 to 40, he tells us what it means to believe in Christ. He describes it this way. Verse 35, I'm the bread of life. Come to me, and you'll never hunger. Believe in me, you'll never thirst. And then he says at the end, verse 40, this is the will of my Father. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. So each time he says, believe in me, believe in me, he adds a little extra to it. So the will of the Christian now is to look on and come to the Son. Come to the Son. Look on the Son. The will and the purpose of the Christian is in faith to come and look upon the Son. It's what Paul's been trying to tell us in his letters. For me, my purpose to live is Christ. To die is gain. I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ, he tells us again and again, is all. This is what our life is about. It's to know Christ. It's to know the Son of God. To look upon him. And you're wondering, why does God send us so much pain and trials? I can answer, I can't say specifically what this trial means or what that trial means. But I can say this. Everything is designed so that you will look upon Christ and know him better. That's the purpose of all these things. And, and just think about your own life here. How many of you here came to Christ or came to a deeper appreciation of Christ through a broken heart? That's... I'm, I'm willing to believe, I don't know that there's another way. I don't know there's another way. Even going through church and raising Sunday school and reading your Bibles and doing all these things, it's like, no, you don't really know God in a near way until your heart is broken. What does the Bible say? The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. You're wondering why. Why are you doing this to us exactly? Why? To, to break your heart. Yeah. Because in a broken heart, we come and we look upon Christ. We have nowhere else to look, do we? When everything's fine, there's no, nothing driving us to the cross. Until we feel our sin, until we feel our own wretchedness, do we finally look to the Christ and see the Son of God and experience His love? That's just how it is. Because Christ is the bread of life broken for us. And so if we're to have union with Him, we are broken too. So to look and to come to the Son and to look and come to the Son by faith that is with our hearts, with our broken hearts, we must be clear about this, that seeing and coming to Christ, the, the crowd saw Jesus, and they came to him, and he tells them, no, no, that's not what we're talking about. He says, I said to you, you've seen me, but you don't believe. He's talking about our hearts. We see him by faith. Coming to church, reading our Bibles, praying, doing all the religious exercises, wonderful stuff, but that's... Faith is of the heart. It's not of the body that we do these things. It's of the heart we see with our heart. Why Paul prays, I pray that he will open the eyes of your heart that you may know these things. And so the will of the Christian is to look and come to Christ by faith with our hearts. 
And I would add to this, and by the power of the Spirit. You may be wondering, well, where's the Spirit in all this, right? We have the Father, we have the Son. What is the Spirit doing? Well, the Spirit, everything is being done through the Spirit. And the reason when God gives people a son, they're coming to the son of their own will because the Spirit has been moving in their hearts to desire the son. That's why Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. That's how this works. He does that work, as Paul says, in our inner being. Okay, let's just get a little bit more practical now because we like to have some things to do. I'll give you a few things here. Now that we believe, what does God want us to do? What now? Well, I want to consider the work of the Christian. And to this, I want us to turn back to Ephesians. Please turn with me there because I'll be reading Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, uh, page 1241. I want to start with the obvious. <clears throat> Paul says in verse 3, chapter 1, Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us. He chose us. He predestined us for adoption. And he did all this in verse 6 to the praise of his glorious grace. Okay, so just imagine for a second. If, if, if let's say, you were dead in sin. You were damned, helpless, hopeless. Let's just say that you were destined for a well-deserved eternity of misery and torment. And let's just say that the Father, out of love for you, for some reason, raised you to life again, gave you to his Son, who cleansed you from all your sins and shame, forgave you. He bore all that pain for you. And then... He raised you to eternal life, to dwell in God's home forever and ever. I don't know, what might be the first thing you do? I mean, I suspect a thank you might be in order here. This really is. It's why Paul says, look, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. It is a miserable thing to be given so much and to be so ungrateful. Our first order of business is to give thanks. To give God thanks for all of this. It's his will, his work. He did this. He didn't have to do any of it. You realize that, don't you? He didn't have to. He wasn't obliged to save us, to bring us to Christ, to his son, to open our hearts. He wasn't obliged to do any of that. He could have left us alone. But he chose us. Thank you. That's why we enter his gates with thanksgiving. And folks, if we are not living a life of such gratitude, you have not experienced the salvation of God. I'm not saying, I don't know if you're saved or not, but you have not experienced it. Give him thanks this second application <clears throat> chapter 2 he talks about how we're saved by grace through faith you remember that right not by works look we're not saved by the works that we do we know that. it's all grace but he says this verse 8 page 1242 chapter 2 by grace you've been saved through faith this is not your own doing it's the gift of God, not a result of works. I'll be clear about that so that no one may boast. You don't deserve it. There's nothing you did. God didn't choose you because you were so good, because you were so much better behaved than the other orphans on the street. No, he, it's by grace alone. I have no idea why he chose you, honestly. No idea. Or me. No idea. It's by grace so that no one can boast. But then he says this, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he tells us what should we be doing. We should be, our next work is to do God's works. Notice that phrase, 
God prepared works for us to do. We're not running around looking for things to do. He has given us things to do, good works that he has prepared us for. He has chosen us for to do those things. If I can put it this way, you know, we, have a, we kind of have a rule in, in our household. If it, we treat our guests like guests. But when a person has been to our home a number of times, they cease to be guests. And they really become family to us. And that means we give them chores to do when they come over. So if you ever come over and we ask you to wash the dishes for us or to sweep the floor <laughs> and like that, consider it an honor to do that. Okay. <clears throat> It is family. We give chores to family members to do. And so God doesn't choose these orphans because they're such hard workers. He chooses them. He cleans them up. He brings them into the home. And he says, now you're part of the family. And you get to do chores. To make this, you have ownership in this home as well. And we have good works to do. And by the way, if you're wondering what good works God has prepared you for. He prepares us for good works through the pain and the heartache that we've been going through, doesn't he? And those things train us, don't they? And if you're wondering where you might be called to serve, it's often in the point of your pain and suffering where you have been tried and tested and he's brought you through that. How many times have I heard people say, you know, I've been able to talk to somebody about something because I went through that. And I'm able to help them or at least to understand, to be a listening ear to them. It's like there are people that go through things I know nothing about and I'm a terrible listener with that. All I can do is kind of nod and pretend to understand, but they know I don't. But someone else who's been through that pain knows what it is. Oh, what a good work that is. What a blessing it is to be that. He has good works for each of us to do. And then finally, the third thing is in chapter 3, verse 14, where Paul sets us an example. Given all this talk of God's grace, and he says in verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, and I am praying for you you may be strengthened with power through his family. That third application of this is to pray for God's family. If we are adopted, we're brought to Christ, we have a new family now. And we must embrace our new family in Christ. Is it not the distinguishing mark of the believer? What does Jesus say? A million times you've heard it. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for whom? One another. He doesn't say, if you have love for all of humanity, that's how people will know you're my disciples. Or if you have love for yourself, because you know it's the greatest love of all to love yourself, right? No. The mark of the believer, the one who belongs to the family of God, is you love your family, your brothers and sisters, one another. That's the mark. And the first order of business for those who love one another is we pray for one another. We pray for one another like we pray for our own children. Constantly, night and day, we are always on each other's minds. Praying for one another, pleading for one another. So important. More important than the prayers you say for yourself. The prayers you say for one another. For this reason. That's why Paul even does this. He, it's funny, I don't even know if I've ever seen Paul pray for himself. He prays for them, and he says, pray for us, that we can preach the gospel boldly. Help us. Give us grace in our time. We pray for you. You pray for us. This is how it works. You know, painful trials have come, and they'll continue to come until Christ returns. And again, we don't have specific answers to why your trial happened the way it happened. I don't know. But we have a general sense of God's plan in it. It's for his purposes. And it's a good plan, even though it's painful. 
It is a plan to adopt people from every nation and to give us to his son as his eternal family. And it's a plan in which we are cleansed from all our sins. And it's a plan that though we, right now, like Christ, are being dashed to the earth in this life with hearts and our bodies broken, it is a plan that ends not in our death, but ends with our resurrection to eternal life on the last day. Let's give him thanks. Father, we pray. You'd please help us, Lord, in our time of grief and trouble, in times of unbearable pain and heartache and frustration, discouragement. Lord, we know this life is a weary one. It's coming to an end. Thank God. Lord, give us hope. Do not let us fall into despair. But to endure these trials, to be steadfast to the end, and to know that you have given us to your Son who will never cast us away, but one day will raise us to eternal life. Lord, please give each of us here faith to believe, to come to Christ, to look upon him, and fill our hearts with your great love that's in him, that we may be to the fullness of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.